Our kids, Caden and Zyler, are three and a half years old, and we're raising them using they, them, their gender neutral pronouns so that they can decide for themselves uh, when, if, and how they want to identify as a gender. Doesn't it just fill you with pride? Loving who you are on the inside. Wave that pride flag up high. Be true to you. Love is love is love, you see, and everyone should love proudly, and we'll all go marching in the big parade. <laughs> wow! Thanks, Blue! Happy Pride Month! When we're older, let's get married! Ha! You can't get married! Why not? Black people can't marry white people! Hey now! It's Garnet! From Steven Universe! Kids, don't be racist! If you were like me as a kid, maybe you imagined two princes or princesses singing to one another. So, to give this classic a new perspective, Please welcome Frankie Rodriguez and Joe Serafini from High School Musical. I can show you the world Shining, shimmering, splendid Hey Greg, look what I found. Hmm? <laughs> Remember this? <laughs> if you didn't know it, would you believe this 11-year-old girl was biologically a boy? Let's get this straight, Jazz. Are you a boy or a girl? I am definitely a girl. Like, that's all I consider myself as. Jazz is transgender, a boy living as a girl. I have a girl brain and boy body. Once we look a little more closely, we realize there's so much more to learn. One love for healthy relationships. I'm really happy. That's teen sensation Jojo Siwa, radiating joy after sharing her truth. She's part of the LGBTQ community. Through this legislation, kindergartners will be taught that boys and girls have different bodies and that there are many ways to express gender. As they get older, students will learn about sexual consent, the LGBTQ community, contraception, pregnancy, and sexually transmitted diseases. My name is Blackberry. I'm a bearded drag queen. It's called Drag Queen Storytime. Um, and so, we're hosting it. This is where Ryan Hart comes in. He's the pastor of a church that decided to rent out a room at the library for the event, held on the same day, at the same time, just a different room. My reasoning and the reasoning of Open Cathedral in having this event is to keep kids safe. And kids are safer when they know that they can love themselves and see the difference. So, uh, Welcome to New Abbey, a Christian, LGBTQ-affirming, progressive, family-friendly church in Pasadena, California. As a gay pastor in the United Methodist Church, Tony Brown feels the need to be the squeaky wheel, speaking out for those who can't. One of the country's largest adoption and foster care agencies, Bethany Christian Services, announced Monday that it will begin providing services to LGBTQ parents nationwide effective immediately. Hi, my name is Sam. My pronouns are they and them. It's also really important to recognize that pronouns change sometimes. Many of us uh, will not always have the same pronouns uh, because our gender is changing. Demi Lovato is opening up about their identity. I want to take this moment to share something very personal with you. Over the past year and a half, I've been doing some healing and self-reflective work. And through this work, I've had the revelation that I identify as non-binary. Grace Semler Baldridge is quickly rising to the top of the Christian music scene, even spending a few days in the top spot on the iTunes Christian chart. The album Preacher's Kid is Semler's debut, a labor of love written entirely during the pandemic. I had a bunch of thoughts. I wanted to get things out of my system, so it sounds kind of grungy. It's like acoustic grunge um, in a God-honoring way, I guess. <laughs> Because we need you.
We need you in our families. We need you in our homes. We need you in our marriages. We need you in this church. We need you in this region. We need you in this country. We declare we know nothing but this Christ Jesus and him crucified. We do not possess a strategy that can change our country. We do not possess a, a blueprint. We do not possess some higher level apostolic um, uh, intel or data. Lord, the, the, the data that we need, it can only be found in you. And we don't need a good idea. We need God ideas and we need courage to be obedient. God, we seek you tonight first for your heart. We need your father heart. And Lord, as we dive into the places that we dive into, we ask, Lord, that we don't partner with the same spirit that is behind these things, but that we would partner with a contrasting spirit, which is a spirit of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I pray, Lord, that your goodness and your faithfulness, that they don't get dwarfed by this epic problem that is facing our nation. But Lord, we ask that your glory would come tonight and that your glory would dwarf the problem and that every single person here would leave with hope tonight. That anyone here that does not know Jesus as Lord, that they would meet you as Savior tonight and that you'd be faithful just like you are Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to show up and to change lives. We're all in need of more life change. We're all in need of more heart change. Forgive us of our pride. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that a humility, a contriteness, that a brokenness would reframe our commitment to see your kingdom come, to see your will be done, in Seattle as it is in heaven. We give you this time. We ask that it be holy, that it be sacred, that the atmosphere here would be protected, and that Jesus, that you'd reveal yourself to each and every one of us tonight because we are in desperate need of further revelation of the Christ. Be glorified, King Jesus. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified tonight. Be glorified. Be glorified tonight. Be glorified, King Jesus. That is our heart tonight, Lord, that you would be glorified. Yes, God, in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. If, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're new here, if this is your first Sunday night with us, um, this is a topical series that we're doing on Sunday nights called The Problem and the Good News. And here's what I did. I sent out a thing on social media, and I just asked that you guys would submit topics, things that are in the headlines, things that are bothering you, that you would submit these things and that you guys would vote on them, that you'd put in, you know, um, that you would like the problem that is... Uh, you know, social media is weird. Amen. But anyway, so people submitted their stuff and they began um, voting and, um, and uh, a bunch of wild kind of topics uh, came in. Uh, in fact, wild, you're like, what do you mean wild? Well, our first week together, um, we, we studied hy hybrid beings. Okay. Um, and if you're like, hybrid what? You'll have to, you'll have to buy the tape. Um, the, the, the second week uh, together, we looked at government and education. So that was last week, and tonight we're looking at um, a gender theory, and I was just looking up on uh, my, my notes here, because I wanted to give you a heads up of where we're going uh, next week, so let me just look here, unless Miss Faith notes. Um, yeah, so I thought, so tonight, gender theory, next week we're looking at critical race theory, CRT, uh, the following week we're going to be looking at the rise of socialism, um, week six we'll be looking at uh, government, uh, government control. And then the last week is the week that everybody's eagerly waiting for. Um, we'll be talking about aliens <laughs> and UFOs. So that'll be the, the, um, the ET uh, phone home. That'll be good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, right off the bat, if you 
have been hurt by the church, if you have been taken advantage of by a minister or by a ministry, if organized religion immediately triggers you, you don't know why you're here tonight, you're just kind of, you're kind of twitching in your seat, I just want to say right off the bat that tonight does not exist for me to use God's word to beat you with a baseball bat because his word is not a bat. It's a very sharp, precise scalpel, and he loves us more than any surgeon would ever love us. So my hope tonight is not to attack you. My hope tonight is that you would not feel attacked, that if you are one that has been even wrestling with same-sex attraction, my hope and the hope of our leadership team is that you would leave here knowing that you are infinitely and radically loved by Jesus Christ. I have nothing in me, okay, that has any desire to attack you. And yet, I do hope to expose an ideology and a worldview that I believe is an anti-human agenda that's part of a larger globalist agenda to not only disintegrate the context of the nuclear family, but to erase the identity of the United States of America altogether. The views I share may not reflect the views of everyone, but I, I would say what we're going to look at tonight is a very specific topic that's a part of something much, much larger and much, much greater, which is why if you call yourself a Christian tonight, before you go attacking flesh and blood, I would caution you, in times like these, we need to know who the real enemy is. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and crazy, creepy things in heavenly places. Yeah. So there's some stuff at work tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to go, uh, we're going to approach this thing at 30,000 feet. We're going to talk about what is the gay agenda. And then we're going to come down a little bit lower and we're going to look at what is gender theory. And then we're going to wrap it up by talking about what is gay theology. And then we're going to look at what the Bible has to say. So in order for us to begin tonight, I want us to begin in the beginning in the book of Genesis. And so I'm just going to read this to you. This is one verse. And it said, and he, speaking of God, created them male and female. And then he did what? He blessed them. And he named them mankind. That God said in the beginning, let us make mankind in our image and likeness. And as this manifested, it manifested in two specific genders, male and female. All right. Everyone in agreement said aye. All in favor, aye. I think that's what your Bible says. That's what my Bible says. If you look it up in the Hebrew, that word male means male. And, in, and that word female, oddly enough, means female. All right. Now, there's this thing right now, and you can find a lot of videos on it. You can find TED Talks and everything, everything else mocking the idea of a gay agenda. Do you, and I remember when I was, when I was younger and, and more punkier than I am now, um, I, you know, I, I, I used to think that this was funny. I used to think, do you really think that there is a gay agenda? Do you really think that somewhere there's this big, long, crazy boardroom table, you know, with all these people in suits, and they're all sitting, you know, and there's, there's smoke everywhere, but nobody knows where the smoke's coming from because nobody's actually smoking cigarettes and it's like super spooky and all these guys like these are the elite elites and they're all sitting around the table and they're thinking like how are we going to assimilate gay into America and I used to I used to kind of think it was funny I used to kind of think come on there is not a, 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 a gay um a gay, a higher gay committee that is looking to kind of revamp and re I used to think it's kind of kind of kind of silly okay and um and uh, it's kind of, kind of funny because there's, there's something weird happening with conspiracy theories lately. <laughs> you 
Yeah, like, like you heard about the conspiracy theory about the killer bees. And they're fighting these things in Washington State now. Have you seen this? These, these, we should have talked about in our hybrid uh, week, week, week one. These, these, actual, these bees are huge. They're, they're these crazy things. And they, they were actually invented in a lab in Brazil. Like this isn't a conspiracy. This is like, this is, they, they invented these things thinking like we're going to take a bee that doesn't normally produce honey and then we're going to take another bee that does produce honey and we're going to create a crazy large mutant mutant bee that produces tons and tons and tons of honey. And don't worry, they'll stay in Africa. It's not like bees can fly. And so they created these things and they created these, these, these things are insane. They got these huge, huge, huge hives and like, and they call them killer bees because the bees kill other bees. That's that. All right, all right, and there, okay, and, you know, there's a lot of different kind of theories and a lot of kind of, kind of different things. There's there's a lot of things, okay, um, recently that have been created in labs. All right, different week. Okay, good time. Is there? Um, let's start over. Now, is there, do you think that maybe in the past that there were people that in their heart they thought. Christianity is going to be a barrier to what we want to have take place. Is it possible that principalities and powers had an anti-Christ, anti-human agenda and manipulated humans as puppets? Is it possible that, I don't know, maybe in the 90s, maybe in the 80s, like, you know, uh, maybe in the early 1900s, that there was some sort of crazy master plan, some sort of big crazy schedule? And the answer is yes. I want to introduce you to Alice Bailey. Now, Alice Bailey, she was known as one of the founders of the New Age movement. She was a writer who lived between 1880 and 1949. And she is the person who is known for creating the term the New Age in her books, which mostly focus on the subject of theosophy. Now, Alice Bailey carved out a 10 point charter. Uh, this was a strategy to subvert the authority of Christianity in America in order to convert the nations to new age philosophies. She carved out a 10 point charter and I'm going to show you uh, what this looks like here. Number one. Now remember this was written in the early 20th century. Take God and prayer out of the education system. Check. Number two, reduce parental authority over children. Check. Destroy the, Ju the Judeo-Christian family structure or the traditional Christian family structure. Check. If sex is free, then make abortion legal and make it easy. Check. Number five, make divorce easy and legal. F uh, free people from the concept of marriage for life. Check. Number six, make homosexuality an alternative lifestyle. Number seven, debase art. Make it run mad. Number eight, use media to promote and to change mindsets. Number nine, create an interfaith movement. Number 10, get governments to make all, the, to make all these law and get the church to endorse these changes. It's, it's kind of crazy because when I was diving into these kind of things, you know, I was like, is there really a, a gay agenda? Like, like, forget that. This is so much bigger than, 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 a, than, a, than a gay agenda. This is an agenda to de-Christianize America. We looked at this last week, like the intent of the pilgrims when they came here and, and the manifesto that they wrote that our journey to America, that this journey and this quest um, is a journey that exists unto the glory of God. And then all of a sudden you begin to see um, people that the enemy is downloading um, blueprints, okay, demonic blueprints into people. Now the good news is, is that if sa Satan can download a blueprint into a person and begin to sow it into society through her writings, what could Jesus do through you? 
I came across a book. I found this really, really interesting. It was called After the Ball. Um, you're not going to be able to buy it on Amazon. They tried to get it removed. It's out of print. It might cost you five or 600 bucks for a book. Um, but you can find digital copies. I had to join a, a virtual library online where I, where I get to borrow the book for 14 days. And um, literally, I'm looking at pictures that have been scanned. Um, people, somebody, somebody scanned an entire book, um, uh, and, 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 and I began reading this. And I was completely blown away. In fact, I, my stomach just got completely sick as I saw this, 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 this work that was published in 1989 by Marshall Kirk and Hudson Madsen. Uh, this is a... a a, they call it a blueprint for the homosexual movement. The book was a global homosexual propaganda campaign to, rema- to replace a marriage-based society with a culture of sexual anarchy. The book is based on a November 1987 Guide magazine article titled The Overhauling of Straight America, which was intended for homosexual activists' eyes only and is a remarkably frank summary of the book's thesis. It is regarded as a must-read for anyone who wants to understand the homosexual agenda. It's also referred to many times as the Mein Kampf or, com- or the Communist Manifesto uh, by the homosexual, uh, homosexual prop- propagandists. In 1987, this article begins to outline the agenda, the goals, and the tactics with, uh, with alarming uh, frankness. And what I'll do here is I'm going to go through uh, uh, the overview, the outline um, of this manifesto. Now, I've included on there a QR code. If you hold your phone up, um, what that's actually going to do is take you to that article word for word, line by line, and then you can read it um, uh, wherever you read stuff. I know where I read stuff. So here we go. We're going to go through this. The uh, overhauling of uh, straight America. Number one. Now remember, this is written. This article written in 1987. Talk about gays and gayness as loudly and often as possible. You got. We got to begin. This is what they begin to say. We got to begin talking about our movement. Okay. We we we, we got to get pride in our movement. We got to get rid of any sort of um, uh, 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 and, and, and embarrassment. Um, we just saw uh, this just come up uh, a few days ago about uh, teachers that are going to ha- start having uh, their children say the Pledge of Allegiance um, to, uh, to the gay flag. Um, we also see, if we go back to, uh, if we go back there, uh, number two, portray gays as victims, not as aggressive challengers. Um, just recent, recently, we saw even in uh, Washington State um, a mandate that Governor Inslee signed, uh, making it illegal for any pastors to sit down with young people who are questioning their sexuality. We also saw the city council in Seattle uh, sign through the same kind of thing. If, uh, if, if, uh, if a parent reports that a pastor was sitting down with somebody and trying to help a child process through any sort of gender confusion, um, that is actually considered um, illegal. And there are big fines that can be given uh, for that. The next thing, number three, give protectors a just cause. Number four, make gay look good. Number five, make the victimizers look bad. So if you're afraid of, uh, you know, any sort of, um, it's so easy to get labeled as, as, as a homophobe. In fact, there was a major campaign that went through um, a couple years ago, where, uh, where they said, it's official, homophobia is now a mental disorder. And, it, and uh, this is stuff that you're seeing rolled out in 2015, but we actually see that the genesis of all this stuff goes back from 1987 to 1989. The things that, you, that were framed out in 1987 are becoming a reality now in 2018, 2019, and 2020, and it's not random. It was planned. You can read the books. Uh, this, this isn't satire. You don't write a 400-page satire entire blueprint going into great detail as I'm going to show you uh, more here um, in a second. Um, Make the victimizers look bad. Number six, we're going to solicit funds. Um, uh, The buck stops here. Um, I'll go through some some of the the formats that they lay out here. Um, uh, Format A, we've got to make it familiar. Uh, To make gays seem less mysterious, present a series of short spots 
featuring um, the boy or girl next door, fresh and appealing, warm and lovable, um, a, a grand, grand, grandma, grandpa types seated in homey surroundings. They respond to an off-camera interview with assurance, good nature, and charm. Their comments bring out three social facts. There is someone special in their life, a long-term uh, relationship. Uh, their families are very important to them and are supportive uh, of them. We have to stress that gays are not anti family and that families need to not be anti-gay. As far as they can remember, uh, they, they have always been gay and were probably born uh, that way. They certainly never decided on a preference one way or the other. Stressing that gays are doing what is natural for them and are not, and are not being willfully contrary. The subject should be interviewed alone, uh, not with their lovers or their children. For to include others in the picture would unwisely raise disturbing questions about the complexities of gay social relations, which these commercials could not explain. It is best instead to take one thing at a time. Uh, so basically, the first part of this strategy is we got to make the whole kind of gay lesbian thing familiar. We got to begin uh, putting um, uh, uh, gay families in, in the context of larger families. And how can we do that? How could we create a modern family? where we could just have fun and just uh, uh, celebrate um, what uh, this, this new, evolved uh, look at the American family. The next part uh, where they were, uh, uh, that they began to lay out is we got to lay out a celebrity campaign. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing here. But they said instead of using modern day celebrities, we can't do that because they might do something stupid and embarrass our movement. So instead, let's go to the past and let's find people in the past that, that, that can't, you know, uh, that were gay and let's uh, let's do a campaign now again this is this is a plan um, laid out in 1987, and we can be we can see this um, June 18th, 2021. People from the LGBTQ movement uh, that were gay that you should know. So we see these plans of of celebrating um, gay people um, within the past. It's also interesting that when you begin to study history, um, if you go back to uh, 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 even back to the first century in the times of the Bible on throughout these different cultures, these different places, you know, in, in Greek culture, homosexuality was very, very, very common up until the time that you got married. And so, uh, uh, so uh, especially kind of in the male uh, kind of culture. And, and, and here's the thing is that there would be homo, there would be um, uh, homosexual sin without taking on homosexuality as a part of your identity. So within that godless culture, sexual sin was sexual sin, it crossed all kinds of lines that didn't mean that you were gay. It wasn't until much, 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 much later that the culture began to take this sin and to build an identity statement around it, attach pride to it. So now it's not something that you wrestle with. Now it's something that you are and you should be proud because it's who you are and you were born that way. In format C, they began to lay out a plan for victim sympathy. The, uh, uh, they lay it out just very clearly, a, a special campaign to stop child abuse. I'm going to read this to you. It says, and as we said earlier, there are many ways to portray gays as victims of discrimination, images of brutality, tales of job loss and family separation and so on. But we think something like the following 30-second commercial would get the heart of the matter. And now they're going to actually give us this idea that came out from their heads of a third, they're pitching a 30-second commercial. The camera moves in on a middle-class teenager sitting alone in a semi-darkened bedroom. The boy is pleasing and uh, uh, unexceptional in appearance, except that he's been roughed up and is staring silently with evident distress. As the camera gradually focuses on his face, a narrator comments, it will happen to one in every ten sons. As he grows up, he will realize that he feels differently about the things that most of his friends. If he lets it show, he'll be an outsider and made fun of, humiliated and attacked. If he confides in his parents, they may throw him out of the house and onto the streets. Some will say he is anti-family. Nobody will let him be himself. So he will have to hide from his friends, from his family. That's, and that's hard. It's tough enough to be a kid these days, but to be one in ten, a message from the National Gay Task Force. And then they comment on it. What is nice about such an ad is that it would 
economically portray gays as innocent and vulnerable, victimized and misunderstood, surprisingly numerous, yet, me, yet not menacing. It also renders anti-family charred, the, the charge of anti-family absurd and hypocritical. Do you see what we have there? We see um, a fictional, emotionally manipulative commercial taking a random fact that they pulled out of a hat with, without any sort of facts behind it, and they're going to turn this into a spot in order to rebrand a movement, saying the end justifies the means. We can lie all we want as long as we get to the outcome that we all want. The final uh, uh, thing that, that caught my attention, I couldn't go through all the parts of, of, the, of the blueprint, as they call it, is called the vilification of victimizers. Damn the torpedoes. We have already indicated some of the images which might be damaging to the homophobic vendetta, ranting and hateful religious extremists, neo-Nazis, the Ku Klux uh, Klansmen, made to look evil and ridiculous. These images should be combined with those of their gay victims by a method propagandists call the bracket technique. For example, for a few seconds, um, uh, uh, we could have a beady-eyed southern preacher is seen pounding a pulpit in a rage about those sick, abominable creatures. And while his tirade continues over the soundtrack, the picture switches to pathetic photos of gays who look decent, harmless, and likable. And then we cut back to the poisonous face of the preacher, and we go back and forth and so forth. The contrast speaks for itself. The effect is devastating. The time is now. We have stretched out here a blueprint, an agenda. All of this stuff that's being rolled out right now, the, 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 a gay agenda. <laughs> you, actually, you actually think that there was a plan that was concocted in the early 1900s? You actually think that there was like a methodical plan that was rolled out in the 80s? You actually think that there was a methodical plan that was rolled out in the 90s and is now coming into its time of harvest? You, you actually think that? No, I know that. And you don't have to be that big of a detective to find it. I didn't have to get some sort of white hat hacker to find this data for me. I, 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 I Googled it for about five minutes. And if you can find something on Google, it ain't, it ain't hidden that deep. By the way, there's, there's some things that you just can't find on Google. All right. I'm going to read this. We have sketched out a blueprint, an agenda for what? This is in their own words transforming the social values of straight America. At the core of our program is a media campaign to change the way the average citizen views homosexuality. It is quite easy to find fault with such a campaign. We have tried to be practical and specific here, but the proposals may still have a visionary sheen. There are 100 reasons why the campaign could not be done or would be risky. But there are at least 20 million good reasons why such a program must be tried in the coming years. The welfare and happiness of every gay man and woman in this country demands it. As the last large legally oppressed minority in American society, it is high time that the gays took effective measures to rejoin the mainstream in pride and strength. We believe, it, we believe that, like it or not, such a campaign is the only way of doing so any time soon. And let us repeat, time may be running out. The AIDS epidemic is sparking anger and fear in the heartland of straight America. See, when you look at the 80s, okay, the, the, the GLBTQ community, uh, it, didn't have, it didn't have its sense of pride to it. It was not celebrated by mainstream America because it still had kind of that, that shame attached to it because of the AIDS epidemic. And people were dying. People in that community were dying. And the question was asked, how do we, we've got ourselves a major, major branding problem. We've got ourselves, a, 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 we, we need to refigure out what this thing is going to look like. And the only way we can do it is with a media campaign. In fact, as I was reading this book, it said our movement is disorganized. We don't have unity. Our movement feels like it's being led by a headless horseman. 
that was written in the 80s. And as it was describing the gay community in the 80s, I felt a little bit like that's kind of what the church looks like in 2020. Not a lot of unity, not a lot of organization, and, and somewhat led by leaders that have no idea where they're going. I'm going to show you um, from the book. That was all from the article. I'm going to show you from the book the marketing strategy beginning with print. Three things that make America great, diversity, freedom, and community. So they thought, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a pro-America ad campaign that nobody can really disagree with. And it'll just so happen to be sponsored by your, your national gay and lesbian community. Here's one. A loaf of white bread, a jug of ink. In Russia, they tell you what to be in America. We have the freedom to be ourselves and to be the best. PSAs, they, they recognize that um, uh, at this time, um, uh, networks were accountable to provide a certain amount of public programming um, that would provide education and warnings based off of things that were happening um, uh, in the culture. And so what they said is that uh, they can't discriminate against us. So we're going to develop public service announcements that are going to be on all the, the main media networks. And the best part is, it's free. When all else fails, um, uh, uh, go for president. Here they begin to lay out their plan to get ca candidates to run for, uh, for uh, 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 gay and lesbian ca candidates to run for different places of political office. They basically say, there's probably no way that we're actually going to get voted in. Um, but hey, it's going to be the whole thing of making things familiar. We're going to go for it. People are going to see that we're decent. And, and so uh, uh, politics was, was uh, a, a part of the, the plan as well. The gloves come off a portfolio of uh, pro-gay ads. Um, a portfolio of pro-gay advertising. Gays versus golfers. Did you know that more Americans live a normal gay lifestyle than play golf or tennis or go fishing? Being gay is natural for millions of people. So why make sport of them? Paid for by your national gay and lesbian community. Is that true? No. You just make stuff up. Meetings plan, parents and friends of lesbians and gays. Uh, 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 what else do we got? Mad, mad, mur murder, homophobe. So if you're not accepting of the gay community, what makes you any different than Adolf Hitler? This is part of, remember we talked about celebrities? Don't pick modern day celebrities. They might let you down. Find people from the past and, um, and celebrate that they, were, that they were gay and radically influential. Now, here, you see on the right there, you got a scorecard. What's interesting about this is they set up rules. Like, uh, uh, and, and, and when you look at the ad strategy, uh, they follow the rules. And so as you're going, things are really, really nice. Things are really, really pleasant. And then as they get going, they begin to realize, not realize, it's a part of the plan. We'll start off with, with, with um, ads that nobody can deny, that nobody can argue with. And then... We'll get to the point that people will be so de desensitized that we'll break our own rules. And at this point, we can be incredibly uh, shocking. Look at the scorecard. All the, all the X's go to the right. Part two. What is gender theory? Gender theory or queer theory is about liberation from the normal. For example, for generations, humanity has agreed to norms when it comes to gender and sexuality. Gender theory regards the very existence of categories of sex, gender, and sexuality to be oppressive. Why does it work? It works because of postmodernism. I wish I would have paid more attention in UTT. Uh, Jenny and I, we went to school at South Christian. There was a class called Understanding the Times. And uh, man, Mr. Dick, phenomenal teacher. He would spend so much time teaching on postmodernism. 
and, 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 and what it was going to be like for the church to do missions in a postmodern era. And he showed like the, the good parts of it and the bar- bad parts of it. But when I was studying uh, uh, gender theory um, uh, and postmodern, it was like, oh, I, I need, where's Mr. Dick? In postmodernism, this is this, this era that we're living in right now, there can be no absolutes. There can't be any morals. There can't be anything that's fixed. What's your truth is your truth. What's my truth is my truth. Now, with a, a crowd of this size, there's at least one of you that said that, maybe even recently. Stop it. That is not true. That is, that's postmodernism. What's your truth is my, what, that's your truth. Right, that's, no, that's postmodernism, and that's a reaction to modernism. And it's anti-fact, it's anti-absolutes, it's anti-morals, and it leads you to a place of just absolute, utter ridiculousness. This is what it does. It breeds a skepticism in a generation about everything so that we do not believe the definitions of anything. This is what's happening in our schools. See, in the old days, you would, you would teach definitions. And now there's no definitions to anything. Gender theory attempts to see artificially something that doesn't exist and demands that everybody else sees it when it doesn't exist. And that everybody else has to speak as though it exists when it doesn't. This is why the biggest enemy of gender theory is not the church, it's not Christians, it's scientists and biologists. The guys that I'm listening to on so many different podcasts, they're not Christians. Some of them are even atheists. Most of them are evolutionists. And they're saying, what are you teaching in schools? Are you stinking kidding me? There's this thing called biology. There's this thing, little thing called procreation. By the way, procreation is assimilation, lest we be the next dinosaurs. I feel like I'm yelling. Okay. <laughs> Calm down. Gender theory demands that you ignore biology completely and you focus upon sexuality as a social construct perpetuated by language. Now, the philosophy of gender theory preaches that categorization leads to oppression. The problem with all these kids, okay, the problem that all these kids are having is language and the definitions for what is normal. So in order to stop the abuse and to rescue these children from psychological slavery, all categories of sex, male and female, gender, masculine and feminine, sexuality, straight, gay, lesbian, uh, uh, bisexual, so on, so on. This is all scripting that people put into them. The only reason why you identify as a man is because you've been programmed by the culture that you are a man. (laughs) Okay, so if you believe that there are two sexes, male and female, if you believe the text that we began tonight with, then your belief structure is seen by this community as oppressive and violent. This is what Twitter and Facebook and NBC and CNN, they believe it. This this is why our team, they are DVRing uh, tonight. Because I can get online tonight and make up a bunch of lies about Biden. And that'll be, that'll be okay. I could be a part of the Taliban and be tweeting tonight, and that would be okay. But if I misgender a celebrity, I will be kicked off of Twitter forever, and I won't be able to argue with them or convince them otherwise. That misgendering someone is the impardonable, unforgivable sin. So we are divvying our tonight because maybe this will get to stay up forever. That'd be awesome. We'll be like, we're under the dar, bro. But this messaging, this media campaign, it was a campaign. It was an agenda. It was a strategy. It was executed. And it is here. It has been embedded in all mainstream media. This is why when it comes to misgendering, according to the worldview, it is seen as the most hideous of abuses. 
And they are censoring and banning, and I hit on that. Let's hit on the objective. The objective of gender theory is to examine, question, and subvert every contrasting worldview that questions or threatens theirs. Break it down, subvert it in order to break them down. I'll say it again. The objective of gender theory is to examine, question, and subvert every contrasting worldview, especially Christianity. Break it down, subvert it, silence it. Yeah. There's, there's stuff right now that, that, that I, freedom of speech. Remember those days? You remember those days? That's called a year and a half ago. And now there are certain things that if I want to talk about it, i got to do it on my blog now because I can't do it on social media. The strategy. The strategy is to build a new language. Why? Because language creates culture. Culture creates categories. And the culture enforces them. And the culture scripts people into them. Create a new language and you can blur the boundaries to the point that the boundaries become arbitrary, oppressive, and can be erased by blurring them into absurdity. So let's dive into this. Here we go. This is what it looks like practically right now in our culture. Remember in the beginning where there was two? Not no more. Okay? It was, remember in the beginning in Genesis when God said, I will make them male and female. Hey, that's two things. Even Darren can remember two things. Male and female. Yes, I got it. Darren's in big trouble if he's going to be expected to, um, to get all these things down. Let, let's go through it. Sex and assigned sex. The classification of a person as a male or female or intersex based on biological characteristics, including chromosomes, hormones, external genitalia, genitalia, and reproductive organs. The term assigned sex is used to acknowledge that sex is often a value determined by medical professionals and is commonly assigned to newborns based on a visual assessment of external genitalia. Man, how shallow. In inclusion here uh, of the recognized category of intersex Frequently overlooked in the discussion of sex. Okay, so you're talking about intersex. What's intersex? Intersex, a person whose chromosomal, hormonal characteristics fall outside of the conventional classifications of male and female. Okay, I got it. All right, good. I'm doing good. I'm keeping up. Sexual orientation. A term that classifies a person's potential for emotional, intellectual, spiritual, intimate, romantic, or sexual interest in another person, often based off of their sex or gender. Okay, good. Now, here we go to the next one. Lesbian. A lesbian is a woman identified. So, okay, so les, a lesbian is one who identifies as a woman who experiences attraction towards another woman. Okay, gay. Gay is a person who experiences attraction to individuals of the same sex or gender identity. The word gay can be uh, used to refer to the attraction experienced by both men and women or only men. Bisexual. A per, a bi bisexual is a person. Uh, why, why do you have to know all this? Because this is what your kids are being taught. So I thought you would maybe like to know. Okay, bisexual, a person who experiences attraction towards, towards more than one sex assigned uh, or gender identity. Okay, pansexual, um, a pansexual is basically when you're gender blind. So you might be attracted to men or you might be attracted to women, but it's not because they're man and it's not because they're a woman. Get it? It don't matter. Let's keep going. Asexual, Okay, asexual is when there's no sexual attraction to any gender. So if you're not attracted to anyone, you're asexual. Okay, gender. Gender is based on expectations and stereotypes about behaviors, actions, and roles linked to a man or woman within a particular culture or society. So gender is being defined as just mere cultural programming. Gender identity is a person's internal and individual experience of gender. So your gender identity is based off of your experience. This could include an intense sense of being a man or a woman, both 
neither, or another gender entirely. What? Okay, so this gender, right, I'm a man, I'm a, I'm a woman, or I'm neither. Okay, good. Gender expression. The way that a person presents and communicates gender with the social context. Gender can be expressed through clothing, speech, body language, hairstyle, voice, emphasis, uh, or de-emphasis of bodily characteristics or behaviors, which are often associated with masculinity and femininity. Trans. The term trans is fre frequently used as an umbrella term for a variety of other terms, including transgender, transsexual, and can refer to terms like gender, queer, a gender, by gender, and two spirit. Okay, we'll get to that here in a second. Which is why you can see that, on, like Genesis says, you pick from two genders, um, male or female, and um, and Facebook says you can pick from seventy different genders. <laughs> Let's keep going. Transgender. A person who does not identify in full or partially with the gender associated with their sex. Um, gender fluid. The term gender fluid refers to the potential for change in ideas, experiences, and expressions. This is where misgendering somebody gets uh, confused. Because if somebody identifies as gender fluid, five minutes ago they might have been identifying as a man. But now they're identifying as a woman. And by the end of the day, they might be identifying as a man. And that's okay because that's how they were born. <laughs> gender queer, a person whose gender identity or expression may not correspond with the social, cultural, gender expectations. Individuals who identify as gender queer may move between gender identities. So here's, here's the difference between gender fluid and gender queer. Gender fluid, you can, you can go between man and woman throughout the day, okay? Um, and gender, gender creative, you can go from man to woman throughout the day. Get it? Why don't you get it? Because there are no absolutes. There is no right answer. Therefore, there can be no wrong answer. So don't put that on me. Don't ask me to pick out my gender forever. Don't, don't even require me to pick out my gender for the day. I don't know how, well, I don't know how I'm going to feel. I might feel really feminine by 10 o'clock tonight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Cisgender is the term used to describe individuals whose gender identity or expressions align with those typically associated with the sex assigned to them at birth. Two-spirit. Some people identify as two-spirit. What are you, a, a, a man or a boy or a girl? No, I'm two-spirit. Okay, what does that mean? It's the, it's the, the term two-spirit encompasses indigenous cultures, okay? So um, if, you're, if you're from like one of the local tribes or something like that and you're wrestling with, with your gender, you, you could be two-spirit. It's your spiritual beliefs, your values, as well as your sexual orientation and gender identity. It's a term used by some, but not by all, indigenous people to describe their their gender and their sexual, the two-spirit identity affirms the interrelatedness of all aspects of identity, including gender, sexuality, community, culture. So if you're here and you're from a local tribe and, and, and you're trying to connect all the aspects of your identity, your gender, your sexuality, your community, your spirituality, your culture, then you're not a man, you're not a woman, you're two-spirit. Oh, okay. Queer is just anyone, basically, that's not straight. And questioning is for those that don't have a clue what the heck is going on right now. But we've got all these helpers, all these guides that are willing to walk. We've got, as we saw last week, the gender unicorn that will help your five-year-old determine which one of these categories they belong in. Why did I cover all this? The information that I just gave you is from the school district's website, and this is language that public school teachers are being required to learn. This is the new normal, and it's not normal at all. This is the new science. I, I, I get to hear about people saying, we just follow the science. And yet it's the very thing that people are saying, don't tell me about the science. I feel this way and my feelings determine the truth. And if you try to put science on me, you're actually abusing me and I am a victim now of your science. My feelings determine 
my reality. Not true. Not true. Why? Because there are truths. And we are at where we're at as a country. We have things like laptops and cell phones. We have things like bridges that exist because of absolutes. Get rid of all binary. Get rid of ones and zeros. Now we're back in the stone ages with clubs trying to beat each other, eating rocks. We're at where we're at right now because of science and mathematics and embracing truth. And now we want to teach an entire generation that there is no truth. The goal is to subvert and reject anything considered normal and innate in favor of queer. And this can make gender theory incredibly frustrating and difficult to understand. I, I was diving into this. I was doing my research. I was like, what the heck is going on? I had notes coming out of my ears. There's so much confusion on this to, to even put together. This thing wasn't even done until 5.30 p.m. and I had to be here at 6 p.m. And it's not because I procrastinated. I started on this thing on Tuesday. I didn't even go to our admin meeting because I was like, I got to dive in. I got to learn how to make sense out of something that makes no freaking sense. I'm going to spend all this time with you, and you're going to leave here, and somebody at work's going to say, well, what did you talk about at church last night? I don't have a clue. <laughs> here are the core values of gender theory. Incoherence, illogic, and intelligibility. There's nothing to grasp onto. This isn't just about gender. This is about the retardation of the next generation. With Bill Gates, who just came out proclaiming he's going to pump a million dollars into this new form of moral relativism math where there are no absolutes, there is no real answer. Why? Because math is now racist. Now, here's my question for, for Mr. Bill Gates. Do you, think, do you think Bill Gates' children are going to be learning that kind of mathematics? No. Why? Because that nonsense is going to be pumped out into the drinking water of the poor. Why? Because Bill Gates does not care about the poor. He does it. The very thing that his foundation exists to do, it, it, does, it does not exist because of his concern for humanity. If he was concerned about the poor, he would figure out a way of how do we teach absolutes? How do we teach difficult concepts to children who, who maybe their parents aren't going to spend even 30 minutes with them that week? How can we equip our teachers to, to train these kids? How can we equip our teachers to get very difficult concepts? Because Bill Gates understands very difficult difficult concepts. He's an incredibly smart man, but he's a part of an incredibly corrupt and demonic system. Because listen, to be as smart as he is and to be supporting math where, where two plus two doesn't have an answer, that means that guy's in bed with someone. And it is not good. It is corrupt. And it's time for the church to say, what are we going to do about it? Because there is truth. There are absolutes. And he's not going to take care of the poor. Who's going to? The government's not going to take care of the poor. Who's going to? The Democrats are not going to take care of the poor. Who's going to? The Republicans are not going to take care of the poor. Who's going to? The public education system is not going to educate your children. Who is going to? Did you see the Oregon school district now says that they will no longer have requirements for mathematics or reading or English. So then what are they going to teach them? I wonder. They're not going to teach them male and female. And now you see GLBTQ history being a mandatory. So math isn't mandatory, but GLBTQ history is mandatory. Darren, I don't like that you're talking about this at church. Maybe we're at where we're at because we haven't been talking like this at church. Part three, 
gay theology. What is gay theology? Gay the, uh, 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 queer theology, gay theology, goes back and forth. Gender variance and queer desire have always been present in human history, including faith traditions and their sacred texts, such as Jewish and, uh, scriptures and the Bible. Queer theology is a theology method. It's a theological method that has been developed out of the philosophy of queer theory and it has been birthed out of postmodernism. This is what it does. It, it's, it's, it's people that are approaching the word of God and saying, there are no absolutes in the scriptures. We get to take our imagination. And we get to, we don't see, we believe it is our role to come over the word of God for us to come over it and to interpret it. But we don't believe that as Christians. We do not get the authority to hover over the word of the Lord to apply our imagination and interpret it. No, our role is to come under the word of God, to submit to the word of God. We don't get the creative license. By the way, there's, there's, um, there's a penalty to pay when you change the word of God, just in case you didn't know that. Okay, and so uh, what, what gay theologians, this is like the hip new thing, gay theologians, gay churches, gay worship, gay, gay, gay. And here's what they're doing. They're, they're applying their postmodernism theology. They're, they're applying this place of no absolutes into the word of God. For example, this is a famous theologian within the scene, Hugh William Montefiore. It's funny, I'm Italian. I thought I might be able to. <laughs> Michael, how do you say it? Montefiore. He wrote a famous paper, 1967, called Jesus, the Revelation of God. That, that's a good name. The only problem is the thesis of his paper was to convince the church that since we don't know anything about the first 30 years of what he calls the hidden life of Jesus Christ, and looking at the fact that he was never actually married, we can only really assume that Jesus was most definitely a homosexual. An entire paper where you've got a part of scripture with no definition. And what does the absurdity of postmodernism do? It empowers you to apply your corrupted imagination and to write something into the scriptures that does not exist. And now Jesus is violating the very law of Moses. And he's even going to violate his own sayings and teachings. And he's even going to violate what's going to come from the Apostle Paul. That would make Jesus a sinner. That would make Jesus a liar. And then, and then for you to put on your priest caller and to say that you're a priest and to say that you have a parish and to say that you're taking care of people when your own perversion is overlaying and subverting the word of God. It's sick. It's demonic. Amen. Within gay the uh, theology, there's an overriding of David, the, the King David, being a homosexual and being in a gay relationship with Jonathan. There's a, an entire thesis um, that, that I had somebody in the church, uh, act, act, they're not here anymore, um, and they wrote their entire master's thesis on what really happened at Sodom and Gomorrah, and it didn't have anything to do with homosexuality. Um, that had to do with everything with bestiality and fornication. That Sodom and Gomorrah had nothing to do with gay love. This is the whole argument right now, is that Jesus is love, okay, and we should be loving, and so loving means accepting. And since we are in this place of, of, of postmodernism, where there is no wrong, there is no sin, there is no morality, there is no answer to two plus two, who are we to judge? Who is God to judge? Who is anyone to judge? So we see guys like uh, Gene Robinson. Gene Robinson is the first openly gay bishop ordained with the Episcopal Church. He wrote a book. It was ordained by President Obama. It was uh, endorsed by President Obama. O Obama doesn't ordain people. In 2012, and it was called God Believes in Love. Isn't it? This is so funny. They take a truth and then they add deception to it. Here's the book title. 
God believes in love. Wow, that's so good. God believes in love. I believe in gravity. Okay. He's got one absolute there. God believes in love. God believes in something. And then, it's, and then the rest of the book is called Straight Talk About Gay Marriage. And then just begins to build out a, a whole theology for why gay should not only be accepted in the church, but actually endorsed in the church. Remember we talked last week about uh, Princeton uh, University. Here is the, um, the professor of theology at Princeton University. This is William Stacy Johnson. We talked about Princeton last week, if you weren't here. We talked about education. Princeton was started by a pastor, Aaron Burr Sr. He was a heterosexual who believed that Genesis was literal and that there were two. What's being taught from Princeton University? He wrote a book in 2006 called A Time to Embrace. Same, same gender relationships in religion, law, and politics. He concludes in his book with these words. The time for full consecration of exclusively committed same gender love is coming. What is he, a prophet? The time is coming for same-sex love that's going to last for a long time. This time is coming. There are compelling theological, political, and legal reasons for us to do all we can to hasten its coming. Not only is the time of, of gay marriages that lasts a long, long time, we must do everything that we can do to hasten it, to make this time come quicker. This is, again, this is from the head of theology at Princeton Seminary. He continues, indeed, it is time... You guys should be like throwing rotten fruit at me right now. All right, it, indeed, it is time. I'm just kidding, don't. I'll throw it back. <laughs> I'll miss. Indeed, it is time for us to embrace those for so many years that have earnestly longed to be treated as equal, valued parts of the human body. Should we love people with, uh, with um, same-sex attraction? Yes. Should we find out what their agenda is and hasten it? No! M. W. Sphero, uh, he is a, a passionate proponent of gay Christianity. Um, this is his book, The Gay Faith. Man, how can faith be gay? I mean, he's just taking everything and just making it all gay. It, it, it's more forceful still. Therefore, if it is true that you try your best to love your neighbor as yourself by your actions, would you not accept and affirm and support uh, 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 and defend your gay neighbor as you would want and need to be treated yourself in the same manner. Especially if you had, hypothetically at least, been born gay, would not homophobia, intolerance, excommunications, exclusions, unjustified condemnations, incitements to violence, work in church discriminations, and ostracisms against gays and lesbians seem very much against God's own will from that viewpoint. He asks, do we not want to be loved by others as they love themselves? Will we not want to be loved by others as God himself loves, unconditionally and without strings attached? This alone should be sufficient reason for organized religion to become, to begin, to not only accept, but to, in addition, actively defend and protect gay and lesbian neighbors as a matter of universal Christian policy. Does God love gay people? See, that's a problem. I said that once at a pastor's luncheon. We have a guy in our church. He's gay. I love them. I love the guy. I'm meeting with the guy. We're having amazing conversations. A pastor of the, of the Presbyterian church up on Capitol Hill, he stopped me. He said, he's not gay. So what are you talking about? He goes, he wrestles with same-sex attraction. Gay is not his identity. I said, okay, all right, all right. So I continue. So, I'm talking, I'm talking. Anyways, like, like I said, this gay guy, he sought me again. He's not gay. And I was like, okay, I get it, I get it. He's like, no, you obviously don't get it. That's the narrative. That's the core of their identity, and it's not true. 
that's a part of the branding. I am gay. I was born this way. If you go back far enough, that was never the understanding of humanity. I do this act, but that's not who I am. This pastor, he corrected me over and over. Why? He wasn't going to let me get away with it. Why? Because he deeply loved the community that he was in that is wrestling with same-sex attraction, and he was not going to let me get away with confirming a narrative that is not of God. He was not going to let me get away with confirming an agenda, because in doing so, I would use my creative breath to undergird and support a lie. We do not get to say, I am gay. We get to say, I'm a child of the most high God and I'm wrestling with same sex attraction. Here's, here's part of the problem that we're wrestling with in the church. We have no idea what the Bible says. So therefore, when we hear people say, God loves all people, yes, God accepts all people, yes. So then why shouldn't you love and accept all people? Yes. Right where they're at, yes. And why shouldn't you defend them? Yes. Okay, awesome. So now you're going to defend their ideology, even if it means subverting your own Christianity. Yes. That's what's happened. Drink this water. It's okay. It's good. It's love. It's not love. Why? There's no truth in it. What's truth? It's the word of God. How do I know that you love me? Because you'll tell me the truth. How do I know that you're putting on a love performance? You'll tell me what I want to hear in order that we can have the appearance of love. What gay theology is doing is not real love. What they have, di what they have done is they have done some stuff. I don't know how to say it without being crude. So look at me, spirit of self-control. But let me just say this. Let me just say this. There's no seed in it. There's no seed in it. It's not real. It can't reproduce. How do you know real love? Because it leads to covenant. How do you know covenant love? It leads to multiplication and reproduction. If you have a church that's not reproducing, if it's not multiplying, there's not love, there's not covenant, and it's lost its seed. It's lost its truth. And now what do we have to build off of? Mere marketing campaigns. And then how are we any different than the slides that we already looked at tonight? Covenant love reproduces. Moses wrote, wrote, wrote a couple books in the Old Testament, okay? So if, if you read the Old Testament, you're going to hear a lot of Moses. He had some things to say about sinning out of sexual brokenness in a gay, lesbian lifestyle. So nowhere, anywhere in the Old Testament is homosexuality ever endorsed encouraged or excused it is forbidden over and over again but people they want to these theologians they want to dive into the words and this word doesn't actually mean this it actually means this and this actually means this and so you know he's actually talking about this and they're completely taking the batteries out of the flashlight the problem is now it doesn't work but then i flip it i say okay all these scriptures, and by the way, it doesn't work. Why? Because there's no math. They're saying, in the Old Testament, two plus two equals six. Just look the words up for yourself. Anybody with Google can look up these Hebrew words. Two plus two equals four every single time. Don't, don't listen to, 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 these, to these guys. Do the math. Look it up in the Strongs. The words, these Hebrew ancient words, they speak the truth. But flip it. Nowhere will you see an endorsement or an excusing. No, no, no. 
It's, 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 it's far, far different. All right, so Moses, pretty important cat. Jesus, pretty important cat. And Paul, he also wrote a lot of the New Testament. If Moses, Jesus, and Paul are all saying the same thing, shouldn't we listen? The only people that are going to say, well, Moses didn't really mean that, and Jesus didn't really mean that, and Paul didn't really mean that. If Moses said it, if Jesus said it, if Paul said it, you better listen. Because if, if you're not listening, you took the wrong pill. And now you're in the realm of absurdity, where your logic is going to lead you to perishing. Yeah. Romans 1, verse 18. Glenn, do this for me, okay? It's too small. I can't see it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. What? Ungodliness? But there is no ungodly. Guys, this is the New Testament, by the way. I I, I found something in the New Testament. This isn't the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. Okay, so the wrath of God, well, we don't like that. Let's Let's just take that out of our Bible. Is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What's happening right now? Suppressing the truth. Two plus two can mean whatever you want. No, it can't. It's, it's four. Okay, well, get off it already. All right, verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, everyone say, for although they knew God. What does that mean? They're believers. They they said they knew him. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. And they did not give thanks to him. And they became futile, loco in the cabeza, in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God. I'm sorry, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity. Here's what, here's what the wrath of God looks like. It's that God says, all right, you want that darkness in your heart. You want that, you say you know me, you say you love me, I've shown grace upon you, I've, I've shown mercy upon you. And, um, um, but because of the lust in your heart, you're not willing to turn away to it. So I have no choice but to release you. The judgment, the wrath of God is seen in this, in the new covenant era that God hands people over to the depravity in their own hearts. God gave them up to their own lust, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because, look at they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to their dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations with those who are contrary to their nature and the men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves due penalty in their air. That's what he says. He says, he says, your depravity brought you to a place where there's no longer any mathematics, where there's no longer any absolutes, where there's no longer any boundaries. And so you gave, you, you, you gave yourself over, the Lord says, and I release you into that. And what did that look like? That looked like men doing things with men that, that men should not be doing with men and, and, and vice versa. In verse 28, and since they did, and this is the Bible, okay? This is, this is actually the ESV. This is a word-for-word word translation from the Greek. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do 
uh, what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, and they are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's, they know God, they knew God, they knew God's righteous decree, and those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. They not only commit the sin, but they create cultures where the sin is celebrated and endorsed by the church. 2021. When I was reading, when I was reading this, the, the, these manifestos and these plans, and I was reading about this agenda that said, we have no unity, we have no organization, We've got a plan, but the plan might fail. It might fail because all it is is branding and marketing. What are we going to do to unify? And again, I felt like the Lord is saying to the church, it's time to come together. It's time to get in God's word. I was reading, I was reading this manifesto, and all of a sudden I was like, God, you're, you're, speaking, you're speaking to me something. You're giving me a call to action in a place where I shouldn't be getting a call to action. <laughs> and this is, in my own words, the call to action. And Chris and Vaughn, can you guys come? How many of you feel like you're ready for some action? God is so good. He's so good. He's so big. And if you've got a big God, you don't need a big marketing campaign. You know what I think was a pretty awesome marketing campaign? Jesus walking on the water when he didn't really have to do that. Taking some fish sticks and loaves and being like, let's just feed everybody with this bath. When you've got a big God, you don't need a big marketing campaign. You don't need a big boardroom table. You don't even need a big whiteboard. You just need a people that are in covenant to love God and to love each other and to see the beauty and the glory of God come down, to see heaven come, to see justice executed, to see uh, sexual brokenness not affirmed but healed. To not, to not just come and, and to say, you in your confusion, it's okay, we're all confused. That's not helpful. I come into a gas station. Help, my wife and I are lost. And the guy behind the counter says, I've been lost for 30 years. Where are we? I have no clue. The blind helping the blind. Christ Jesus is our hope of glory. And as Bill Johnson says, he wants out. What's the call to action? First of all, there's got to be some action. And it's got to be through everyday imperfect believers. Who don't put on the performance of perfection but we're walking in brokenness, humility, transparency. Not trying to tell people that we're better than them, but we're pointing them to a faithful shepherd. We're pointing them to absolute truth. You've got a problem, but we have an absolute answer. His name is Jesus. Here we go. Call to action. Number one, we've got to begin to instigate urgency. 
that means now. Now is the time. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time of healing. Now is the time of deliverance. Now is the time to pray. Now is the time for breakthrough. Now is the time for convergence. Now is the time for revival. Just declare, I'm a revivalist. I'm, full, I, I'm, a, I'm a great awakening waiting to happen. Now is the time. I said, to, I said to Roy, I said to Roy Simmons this last week, I said, my role as lead pastor here at Sarah Vile Center is to instigate urgency in the whole team. And if I am working with a leader and they're not sparking up, they're not firing up on me, if I, then we've got we've to get them out of here because complacency is contagious and we can't have apathy and, and complacency and lethargy and just be like, it's okay. You know, it's okay. It's not okay. We've got to instigate urgency. Come on, church. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Show up. Talk up. Speak up. You don't have to be perfect, but you got to show up, man. You got to know what you believe. I'm afraid that they're going to make me look like a fool. I'm afraid that they're going to ask me questions that I, that I don't know. Hey, just stick to the truth. Stick to two plus two is four, and that ain't going to change. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. Shake yourself right now. You need to shake yourself right now. Why? Why? Because some of us have been inoculated with churchianity, and we've been told that, that preachers with microphones are going to do all the works of the ministry. We are the stinking body of Christ, and you are needed. You are needed. You are needed. Needed. You are needed, John Shada. You are needed, the, uh, Matt and Emily. You are needed, Lambrix. You are needed. Your children is needed. Shake yourself. Say, wake up! It, instigate urgency everywhere. And when you find apathy, you call everybody on it. That seems pathetic. That seems apathetic. That seems lazy. These are times we've got to wake up. We are the church. We are the body. You have authority. There's an urgency. There's an urgency. It's the time. Now's the time. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not next year. It's time. It's time. It's time. And you go home and you say it's time. And you go to work and you say it's time. And you get on Facebook and you say it's time. No delay. No delay. No delay. It's time. Just, just clear. I'm an instigator. I'm a catalyst of urgency. It has to happen now. It has to shift now. Mindsets have to shift now. Perversion, you're a spirit. You've got to shift now. You've got to go now. The voices, they've got to go now. The temptation, the snake has got to go now. I'm all for process. I'm all for process, but the process starts stinking now. It starts now. It starts now. Number two, restore identity. Who's called to restore identity? Every person in this room. To restore identity. And what does that mean? It means that every single person here knows how radically valuable that you are. You know how valuable you are. You are not replaceable. You're not just a, a, a hamster in the old lab wheel. No, no, no. You are valuable. Declare right now, I am valuable. I have an important role. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm needed now. Look at the other person next to you and say, I'm needed here. Just declared into the atmosphere, Seattle is in need of me. I don't know why the McCoys are still here, but I know that Seattle's in need of them. I know, I know there's a lot of Muslims here. There's a lot of broken people. I don't know how long it's gonna be, but for this, for this time, for this right now, I don't know what tomorrow looks like. I know that, that, that sooner rather than later, they're gonna be back in Jakarta, but I know that while they're here, Seattle will be better because they are here. They're needed now. Just declare, I am needed now. I am valuable. Man, don't let, religion is done its dastardly best to convince us that we are worms, that we are depraved, that we are dejected, that God just puts up with us because of the blood of his son. No, you are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I know who I am. 
I know what you have called me to do. I don't feel it. I don't like it. I don't want to go to church today. I don't want to go to Connect Group on Wednesday. I don't want to be, I, I just want to pout. I just want to be angry. I want to be vindictive. I want to be manipulative. But I know that's the old me. I know that's the dead me. And I know the earth needs me now. And I know that I'm valuable. And I know if I show up, His grace will come upon me. And I know if I speak up, He will anoint me. And I know that I will speak as an oracle of hope. I know that God will use me. Declare this with you right now. I know my God is going to use me tomorrow. Declare, I know my God is going to use me this week. I know the devil don't get to use me no more. Just say this out loud, Satan. You don't get to use me no more. You don't get to manipulate me no more. I'm a new creation. I'm filled with hope. I'm not going back to Pharaoh. I'm moving forward. I'm advancing. I'm pressing on. This is why community is so important. Why? Because we forget. In isolation, we forget. We forget who we are. We forget where we're going. In isolation, we get amnesia. I don't have to go to church. I am the church. The church is the ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones that gather, the ones that connect, the ones that are intentional, the ones that say, I want to know who you are and I want to know what you are about. What's your superpower? I sense the Wawa of God on you. I want to know you. Restore identity. Restore identity. I pray Holy Spirit comes right now. It restores your identity. I pray that you be reminded tonight that you are a prophet of hope, that you are an oracle of righteousness. You've been called of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Know who you are. Know who you are. You are valuable. It's time to show up. It's time to show up. It's time, it's time to get some new shoes. It's time to get some new clothes. It's time to buy some deodorant. I am valuable. It is urgent. It's time to show up. Number three, see the potential. See it. Don't you see it? See it. See it. See it. Write it down. Write it down, write it down, write it down. You have so much potential. Your thing has so much potential. The vision has so much potential. There's so much potential. It's, it's bigger, it's bigger than you want it to be. It's bigger than you want it to be. It's bigger than you want it to be. SRC is going to be bigger than you want it to be. Our school is going to be bigger than you want it to be. You're going to be bigger than you want to be. You're going to be big because your spirit's big, because your Jesus is big. You got to think big. You got to think cities. You got to think nations. You got to think people groups. It's all about the one. Yes, but it's all about the one nation. I want a nation, I want a city. I'll trade you, you give me your Korea and I'll give you Japan because I like Korean barbecue. I, what are you contending for? What nation are you contending for? Yeah, start praying, start believing. God, you're going to give me Korea. God, you're going to give me Japan. God, you're going to give me Maui. Hallelujah. What's the potential? What's the potential? What, you need to surround yourself with prophetic people. You need to surround yourself. Yeah, you shouldn't be embarrassed to say, hey, prophesy over me. Go ahead, just give me a prophetic word. Just just to walk walk up to somebody in the, that you have relationship and just say, give me a prophetic word. Why? Because I because my I, I my potential's been leaking. It's been leaking, and I've fallen into mean, menial, ordinary, a maintenance mode. And in doing 
so I've lost vision. And my Bible says that when people lose vision, they cast off restraint and they start making what my wife calls unwise choices. When you see people that are making unwise choices, it's not that they're an idiot, it's just they've lost their vision. They've lost their vision. Too many people in the church, whoa, 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 where to go, where to go? They've They've lost, their, they've lost their vision. We need a prophetic people that says, I see who you are. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans not to harm you, but plans to give you a future and a hope. I know that you're struggling. I know you've been through some things. I knew that your dad wasn't there for you. I know that your mom never held you, but God was there and he wants to love you like a father. He wants to restore your sexuality. He wants to restore your emotions. I know the plans I have for you. You have so much potential. You have so much potential. You are not an accident. You are a child of God. He formed you. He framed you. He created you for such a time as this. Religion says you should be ashamed of yourself. But your father says you are loved. I love you, my child. I love you, my child. I will redeem you. I will heal you. I will embrace you embrace you. I am that big. I am that powerful. I am that capable. That's who I am. I am Jesus. I am a savior. I am not intimidated by your storm. I'm not intimidated by your darkness. In your darkness and in your storm, in your sexual chaos, I will hover in the midst of it. And there in the chaos, I will speak and I will say, let there be Light. Let's stand, let's stand, let's stand, let's stand, let's stand. I need you to stand tonight as a king. I need you to stand tonight as a priest. I need you for you to hover in the chaos. I need for you to hover in the darkness. I need you to hover in the, in the, in the realm of perversion. I need you to hover with the Spirit of God. I need you to declare, let there be light. 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 Let there be Put your hands on your heart. Let there be light. Put your hand on your, on your mind. Let there be light. Light of heaven come right now. Jesus come. Jesus come. All through this room. Heal. 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 Jesus walk through this room. Come face to face right now. Let your glory come, hallelujah. Let your glory come, hallelujah. Let your glory come, hallelujah. Let your glory come. Just invite him to come, just say, Jesus come. Jesus come. So come, King Jesus. 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 Right now, right now, right now, let there be light, let there be light, let there be light, let there be lights, let there be lights, let there be lights. Let there be lights. Fill the night with the lights. Fill the night with the lights. Fill the night with the lights. Let the heavens illuminate. Let the heavens glow. Oh, let the glory come. Let the glory come. Let the glory come. Glory come. Glory come. Fill the night with the lights. Fill the night with the lights. Let the lights come. Let the lights come. Let the lights come. Let the heavenly messengers of heaven come. Let the heavenly messengers of heaven come. The servants of God come, 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 come. Holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. 
holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Shakarako shikiri ama sukoro boku shiri ama soro kushi. Shiri ama kusoro kushi kira ama sikira. Shoro boku shikiri ama sukoro. He shara ma ki shiri ama sukoro ro. He shara ma yeah 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 yeah. He shara ma ki shiri ama sukoro ro. He shiri ama soro kushi kira. He shara ma. Chris, just bring it down just a second. With every head bowed and every eye closed, close your eyes so that all this natural stuff disappears. Would you declare this with me? Just say, Father, you're holding someone, and you're bringing them near to your heart. They represent a people. They represent a community. Maybe even a leader. Jesus, would you show me who it is that you're bringing in close to you? Because I want to bring them towards me. Jesus, I want to see them with your eyes. I want to love them with your heart. With no strings attached. With a selfless, undefiled love. With a love without agenda. Would you show me who you love? Would you show me how you want to love them? Turn the light on, King Jesus. Let me see their face. reminded of the angels that appeared to the shepherds the night that Jesus was born. And they said, we have great news, of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a saving one. That is Christ the Lord. And you should know him when you find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. We have great news of great joy that is for all the people. A Savior has come. It is Christ the Lord. Father, we ask for the grace that like those angels, like those messengers, we would illuminate the night sky and make it known our message is not a message of condemnation. Our message is the gospel. And what you need is an affirmation. What you need is salvation. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. If you need prayer for anything tonight, we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to stand with you. If you're struggling, if you feel oppressed tonight, Jesus is here and he'd love to set you free. We'd love to just invite you just to come to the front. If you need encouragement, you need a brother to stand with you, sister to pray for you. We'll just leave this altar open. 
Otherwise, know this, you are so radically and infinitely loved. And it has created you for such a time as this. God bless you guys. Love you guys.